This video will explain how to buy Bitcoin from exchanges, ATMs, and in person, and give the pros and cons of each of those methods. Of course, once you buy Bitcoin, you need a place to securely store it. I'll also demonstrate using a web wallet, hardware wallet, and finally a paper wallet for cold storage. In general, different wallets provide a trade-off between convenience and security. Just like you wouldn't carry your life savings in your pocket, it's a good idea to keep a small amount in a convenient wallet and larger sums in more secure storage. This demo is an excerpt from a larger three and a half hour course on Bitcoin and blockchain projects like Ethereum, which is linked below. While it is a paywalled site, you can watch 95% of it for free with Pluralsight's free trial. The easiest way to get Bitcoin is to buy some at an exchange. I'll demonstrate this on Coinbase.com, an exchange where US and European customers can fund accounts via wire transfer or even credit cards. When you first sign up, you'll need to provide some identification and bank information that can vary depending on how much you want to buy and where you're located. After that, you simply go to the Buy Sell page, enter the amount, and click the Buy button. If you've linked a credit card, small amounts will become available instantly. If not, the time largely depends on how long it takes the bank to send funds, which with the US ACH system is 3 to 5 business days. Coinbase charges a 1% fee for the exchange. A small note about privacy and exchanges. In the US, companies that transmit money are required to comply with a number of laws to prevent terrorism financing, fraud, and money laundering. These laws require exchanges to know their customers and monitor transactions for any risky behavior. So while sending and receiving Bitcoin can be done relatively anonymously, exchanging it with fiat currency usually requires revealing identity. While exchanges are typically the most convenient and cheapest way to buy Bitcoins, you can also get Bitcoin at some Bitcoin ATMs and in person-to-person -person exchanges. There are several ATM directories online, including one at the Bitcoin news site Coindesk and CoinATMRadar.com. These maps give you details about the cost, limits, and which direction the ATM operates. Unlike regular ATMs, most Bitcoin ATMs only work in one direction, cash in, Bitcoin out, and not the other way. One good way to find others willing to buy and sell is through Bitcoin meetups. There's also an eBay-like site called localbitcoins.com that helps buyers and sellers find each other, complete with a reputation system. It also facilitates online trades by operating an escrow service that holds funds until a transfer is verified. Note that many ATM and in-person trades will cost much more than exchanges. A 10% fee or higher is not uncommon. Also, many traders on local bitcoins have minimums in the hundreds of dollars. If you decide to purchase bitcoins locally or at an ATM, how do you receive them and hold them? Bitcoins are held in what is called a wallet. For example, I used a wallet app called Airbits at the beginning of this course to send bitcoins to purchase the video. Wallets generally facilitate sending and receiving money, as well as listing your balance and transactions. I'll demonstrate receiving money on the Mycelium wallet. You simply tap the Receive button and are presented with a QR code. You can show this to another person that has a phone-based wallet to scan or at an ATM to scan. You can also copy and paste the Bitcoin address shown here and send that in an email. The QR codes from this wallet also allow you to include a request amount. When the code is scanned, the other wallet will auto-fill in the amount. Wallets don't just come in the form of smartphone apps. There are also online web page based wallets, such as blockchain.info. Online wallets contain many of the same features, including a transaction log and forms to send and receive money. When choosing a wallet, a great resource is Bitcoin.org, which lists many along with pros and cons. Many have differences in terms of features and security. A new feature on some is multi-signatures, which, for example, would allow officers in an organization to spend money only if two of three authorize it. Some wallets provide increased privacy through Tor connections and by creating new addresses for every transaction. 
On the security side, the most secure are full nodes, which are actually what the bookkeepers run, and check every transaction in the entire world independently. Mobile wallets don't have the resources to do this and often connect to a sampling of bookkeepers or trusted third parties. One of the most important considerations is where the private keys are held. In Bitcoin, the private keys are what ultimately control funds. The term private key comes from public key cryptography, the encryption scheme behind the digital signatures that protect individual accounts. Unlike the password to your bank account, if the private keys to your Bitcoin wallet are lost, there is no way to access your funds. People often use the phrase, be your own bank with Bitcoin, and this is because you and you alone hold access to your funds. Many wallets like Mycelium, Airbits, and Blockchain.info advertise as never having access to the private key. This is good in that there's no way they can steal your funds. However, it also means if you lose your password to the apps and don't have a backup, your funds will be irrevocably lost. That money will effectively be erased from the world. Coinbase, the exchange where I showed purchasing Bitcoin, also has an online wallet. Unlike the other wallets I just mentioned, Coinbase does control the private keys of any Bitcoin balance it shows. While this would allow Coinbase to abscond with your funds and face legal consequences, it also makes it less likely that you would lose your money due to user error. At its most basic level, a wallet is simply a private key or collection of private keys. You can generate a paper wallet that is simply a private key and its associated Bitcoin address at bitcoinpaperwallet.com or bitaddress.org. I move my mouse around to generate a random number, and then client-side code generates a Bitcoin address and corresponding private key. I like showing a paper wallet because it will hopefully clarify just what it means to hold Bitcoin. If I send funds to this Bitcoin address, the bookkeepers in the network will update their ledger to show that amount for that Bitcoin address or account. Then only a person that knows the corresponding private key will be able to create an authorized request to move that balance to someone else. So we see that holding Bitcoin really means holding a private key or password to enable transferring those coins. For storing large amounts of Bitcoin, it's recommended that you use cold storage, which means sending Bitcoin to an address that never touched the internet. The paper wallet site I just showed recommends you download the site's HTML code, transfer it to a computer not on the internet, and then generate the address there to avoid any risk of the private key being stolen. There are also hardware-based wallets like Ledger and Trezor that help to shield private keys from the internet. These wallets sign transactions internally without ever exposing a private key to the internet. I'll demonstrate Trezor briefly. I'm using it with a desktop software wallet called Electrum. I first create a transaction in Electrum by entering a receiving address and amount. I then plug in the Trezor and enter a PIN using a combination of a blank keypad on my monitor and the Trezor's display. This is so a virus recording my screen can't learn my PIN. Both Trezor and Ledger are designed to be secure even if using an infected computer. Finally, I confirm the receiving address on the Trezor, it signs the transaction, and sends it back to the computer, which then broadcasts it to the Bitcoin network. Whatever wallet you use, it's important to make backups, especially if using a wallet whose developer or company does not have access to the private keys. A backup can take the form of a file that's encrypted with a password, or in the case of Mycelium, a list of 12 to 24 random words. The wallet app can reconstruct the private keys and addresses just from these words. If you memorize these words, you now have what's called a brain wallet. It's a somewhat astonishing idea. Millions of dollars could be held in a memory and nowhere else.